As a member of the ESG Working Group at the French Institute of Corporate Directors, I am very happy to share with you today's webinar about the European Union Taxonomy Regulation. We will try to answer a few questions. What should directors know about it and its potential implications on European and non-European companies? To discuss this important matter, I am very pleased to welcome Max Weber and Eric Pedersen. Max is a risk partner at the Financial Services Consulting Practice at EY, based in Germany. He also leads and coordinates the sustainable finance activities for the banking capital market for EY. Eric Pedersen is head of responsible investment at Nordea Asset Management and also a member of the Nordea Investment Committee. Thank you both to share your experience and knowledge with ECODA's members. First question for you, Max. What is the purpose of the EU taxonomy and how does it fit in the broader context of the EU Green Deal and EU Sustainable Finance, uh, so EU Action Plan and Sustainable Finance? Uh, Florence, um, I'm, I'm happy to answer that, but first let me say that I'm very happy to be with you today and uh, support you on that uh, important issue and answer a few questions. So the EU taxonomy is, is the cornerstone of the EU action plan on sustainable finance, um, which came out in early 2018. And the main intention of that action plan, uh, which describes 10 fields of actions, um, is to support the reorientation of capital into more sustainable investments or economic activities. Um, and uh, one of those 10 action is a classification system of uh, to, to assess whether an economic activity is sustainable or not. So that's the taxonomy, basically. Uh, other actions in that action plan aim to incorporate um, ESG considerations into financial market regulation and to foster transparency, as well as to incentivize creation of long-term value and prevent short-termism. And important, please note, as far as transparency is concerned, the taxonomy has immediate and urgent implication, and I think that's why we are talking about that today, for large corporates that fall under the uh, non-financial reporting directive, so the NFRD, as they have to consider the taxonomy in their non-financial reports starting in 2020 for fiscal year 21 already. So with the EU Green Deal, the EU Commission has emphasized its ambition to make the EU carbon neutral by 2050 and to reduce carbon emissions by 55% by 2030. The EU Green Deal investment plan will mobilize 1 trillion euro, so 1 trillion, to support sustainable investments over the next decade and will develop a framework for private investors to facilitate sustainable investments. And up to 250 billion euro each year are needed to make investments more sustainable. And those projects that research and develop new technologies that are even more impacting net zero ambition as existing ones. So the EU taxonomy in that framework tries to establish a science-based dictionary defining which activities are sustainable and sets disclosure requirements for various financial actors and corporates about the extent to which their investments or economic activities are sustainable according to this dictionary. Note that this is the first time sustainable activities are scientifically defined by regulation. Yes, so why is this uh, EU taxonomy strategically important for a company? There are a few things, Flo. So first, it will be a grid of analysis uh, and disclosure requirement for the financial community willing to invest, invest in or finance sustainable activities. Uh, so second, as I already mentioned, from 2020 onwards, companies that fall under the NFRD and therefore need to disclose non-financial statements, will need to disclose information 
on how and to what extent the activities are associated with economic activities that qualify as sustainable. Saying that the ecological or environmental impact of a company's activity will become more transparent in the future. In the future. So third, it will be used to develop sustainable financial products. For example, the EU Green Bond Standard, EU Benchmark and other EU eco-labels that might arise in the future. It will also be used as a tool to assess whether financial products offered by financial market participants, such as asset managers, pension funds, life insurers, are linked to sustainable investment. Financial market participants need to disclose information accordingly. And fifth, going forward, the taxonomy will be used in prudential capital requirements for banks in a way that assess that assets related to environmental objectives will get a lower risk rate. So that's, for example, the infrastructure risk rate uh, factor. But furthermore, the taxonomy can also be used by companies willing to progress on their sustainable journey. The taxonomy is a valuable tool to set strategic targets to move, shift sustainable activities and track progress. Also, the taxonomy can be used and most probably will be used by the EU itself and national states as screening criteria for public procurement, public aid and recovery plans. In addition, it is most likely that banks in the future will use taxonomy or technical screening criteria, we come to the technical screening criteria later, in their decision whether to grant a loan or to which conditions as they have to disclose green asset ratio for the loan portfolio from 2020 onwards themselves. And finally, it can be used or will be used by risk managers to assess the transition risk of a financial services firm's portfolio. Thanks, Max. So we understand that the EU sustainable finance package really appears to be the most ambitious leg legislative plan globally to shift capital flows to sustainable activities. And the EU taxonomy is a cornerstone of this EU package. Max, can you dive a little bit more into the taxonomy and, and tell us what is considered a sustainable activity? Yes, sure, and, and in a very formal way, and I now need to go a bit uh, deeper into the, uh, in, into the taxonomy itself, so in a formal way and according to Article 3 of the regulation, an, acti an economic activity can be classified as a sustainable activity if it substantially contributes to one or more of the six environmental objectives and does not significantly harm any other of the six objectives. We come to the six objectives in a second. The activity then also needs to be carried out in compliance with certain minimum safeguards. Uh, for example, the International Bill of Human Rights, ILO Convention, OECD guidelines for multinational enterprise, etc. And these safeguards then will cover the S and G in the broader ESG context. So now what are the six environmental objectives? Um, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. That's, these are the first two uh, objectives and I think when we look at the current discussion about climate change and so on, the most important ones. Then we have four others, sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, and finally, protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. So these are the six environmental objectives. For each of these uh, environmental objectives, the EU Commission will then issue delegated acts with detailed technical screening, uh, screening criteria. And for the first two objectives, so as I think the most important ones, climate mitigation and climate adaptation, um, these criteria have already been drafted by the so-called technical expert group and issued in a draft delegated act that shall be published very soon we expect April, maybe May, because there are still some political discussions ongoing. Uh, for the other four objectives, delegated acts are announced to be published later on for application in 23. Yeah. So now when we look what needs to be done, 
to assess whether an economic activity substantially contributes to an environmental objective. First, it needs to be part of a list of activities identified in the Delegated Act and reference to NAE's macro sector. So that's the first step. And then the activity needs to meet several technical screening criteria to assess whether it is eligible at all to contribute uh, to the objective and scope. If that is the case, then the do not significant harm or DNSH test need to be performed to make sure the activity does not harm any of the other environmental objectives. Finally, the activity, as I said, must meet the social minimum safeguards. For climate change mitigation, then it is important to mention that climate change mitigation includes, on the one hand side, activities that are already low carbon, but also activities contributing to a transition to net zero emissions economy by 2050, so the so-called transition activities, and finally, so-called enabling activities. So, Transition activities are those activities for which there are no technological and economically feasible low carbon alternatives today, but that support the transition to a climate neutral economy in a manner that is consistent with the pathway to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, as we have all agreed in the Paris Agreement. So, for example, by purchasing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, please note that there is currently an uh, intense debate around which activities should be regarded as transition activities, in particular when we talk about gas and nuclear power. Um, enabling activities are those activities that, by provision of their products or services, <clears throat> enable a substantial contribution to be made to other activities. That is, for example, the manufacturing of low carbon technologies that can be used by other firms or the storage of thermal energy. Transitional activities are those activities that support the transition to a climate neutral economy by phasing out greenhouse gas emissions. So it is important to note that the current EU taxonomy does not currently assess which activities should be seized in order to achieve EU climate goals. Okay, so um, that's very, uh, very important criteria, all those, and, and, and it's, it's a very technical uh, regulation, actually. So uh, it could be um, nice, Max, if you, if you provide an example of how it works. Um, can you uh, provide this on, on a specific industry, for example? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's true. That's very... Uh, technical and and um, most probably not easy um, to apply, but but let's try it with a, with a simple example. And um, I, I picked an example from the automotive industry, yeah, because that's of course very important at the moment. And um, we we have a company that manufactures passenger vehicles, for example, um, and um, the company has started to produce uh, electric cars and and also cars with hydrogen energy uh, engine sorry um, but however of course um, it, it's a it's a traditional automotive firm um, so uh, the the turnover of that company um, still is 60 percent in the com composition segment yeah um, and uh, and that segment is not taxonomy aligned because that's not an activity which is within the taxonomy um, however, 30% of the turnover of that company uh, is linked to electromobility and 10% and, and, and uh, is linked to hydrogen mobility. Yeah? So let's take that as an assumption. And um, for the activities then electromobility and hydrogen mobility, um, we need to apply the relevant technical screening criteria. Yeah? Uh, so we have identified these are two uh, activities which fall uh, under the uh, taxonomy um, and now we need to go into the technical screening criteria and we find out that both uh, of these um, 
engines, uh, electri electromobility and hydrogen mobility or engines, those are um, taxonomy aligned activities because they substantially contribute to climate change mitigation. Yeah? Um, and furthermore, um, we also found out that they do not significant harm any of the other five uh, objectives. Um, and then afterwards, we have to test whether they uh, also meet the social safeguards. Yeah? And um, then if we say, okay, yes, they meet the social safeguards, then we can say that uh, from that company, 40% of the turnover is taxonomy aligned. Yeah? And why is that information important? That information is important, for example, for a fund manager who has promised within, um, uh, to, to, to the investors that a certain degree, a certain percentage of um, the, 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 the assets in the fund are taxonomy aligned. Um, so, and um, when we look at companies, of course, we need to define which part of a company is taxonomy line. So that's why that information, 40% is taxonomy line, is important for uh, financial market participants. So I hope, Florence, that this example uh, made it a, bit, a little bit clearer, at least. Yes, yes, thank you. And, and uh, so we see that there are technical criteria that are very well defined. Um, uh, will that taxonomy evolve over time or is it, you know, fixed already? <clears throat> no, it, it will evolve over time. And I, I think they, <clears throat> the, the Commission made that very clear <clears throat> when formulating the taxonomy. And, and why? Because we have technical improvements over the next couple of years and not over the next couple of years going forward. <clears throat> and um, um, we, we, the, the, the environmental objectives also may change. We don't know yet. We have now these six environmental objectives. Maybe we have other environmental objectives in, 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 in 10 years or so. And then I think that's um, maybe the most important issue. When we look at the activities which are at the moment um, in the taxonomy or in the technical screening criteria, we are still missing um, activities which we think will substantially contribute uh, to one of the objectives. So, and, and this is also where we see new technical screening criteria or the screening criteria change in the future, that we will have additional activities to include into the, uh, to, into the taxonomy. And for example, transition activities should be reviewed uh, every three years. Yeah? So that's also uh, which is written in the taxonomy. And um, to review the criteria, the Commission has set up the so-called Platform on Sustainable Finance. <clears throat> and this Platform on Sustainable Finance, for example, also define the technical screening criteria for uh, the, 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 the four um, uh, objectives where we don't have the technical screening uh, criteria at the moment. And in the next coming years, it is also expected that the EU Commission will publish a social taxonomy, including social objectives, because when we look at the taxonomy today, we have the environmental objectives and the social, the, the S of the ESG context, we only have with the social safeguards. Yeah, so more implicitly. And with a social taxonomy, we then will have it explicitly. Okay. Um, now, um, which, could you tell us which companies uh, fall under the scope of the taxonomy and what information should those um, uh, companies disclose? Yeah, happy to do so. So uh, again, let, let me go into the, in, into the regulation. According to Article 1 of the regulation, um, the regulation applies to, on the one hand side, financial market firms that offer financial products. And I already mentioned asset managers, uh, life insurances, and so on. Um, or banks that offer portfolio management. <clears throat> and on the other hand, corporates that are required to publish a non-financial report, that means those corporates, large corporates that fall under the non-financial reporting directive. So financial market firms, let's go to this uh, part of firms first, that offer <clears throat> the before mentioned products, so financial service products, need to disclose amongst 
other whether ESG products or sustainable investments that they offer to their customers are taxonomy aligned. This applies from 2020 onwards as regards to climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation and then from 23 onwards for the other four environmental objectives. This information needs to be disclosed in the pre-contractual information and on their websites. Yeah? So, and then we have the corporates that fall under the requirements to publish in non-financial reports. And these um, corporates need to incorporate uh, certain KPIs in their reports. Article 8 of the taxonomy regulation requires corporates to report how and to what extent the activities are associated with taxonomy-aligned activities in connection with the non-financial reporting directive. So non-financial firms are expected to report their alignment with the EU taxonomy both in terms of prop proportion of their revenues or turnover, so that was my example with the turnover, uh, and expenditure, capital expenditure and operational expenditure. This applies from 22 onwards as regards to the climate change and um, uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation and from 23 onwards again for the other four environmental objectives. Uh, we are still expecting level two regulation that should be more precise on what corporate then exactly need to disclose most probably with, with templates, with tables uh, and, and maybe a bit more details on the how to calculate the KPIs, turnover, CAPEX, OPEX and so on. So looking ahead uh, a bit more on the timeline with the planned revisions uh, of the non-financial reporting directive, uh, non-financial reports and with that uh, the information of revenues, turnover, CAPEX, OPEX related to sustainable activities will become much more important. That is because, amongst others, the revised uh, NFRD intends to incorporate the non-financial report into the management report or annual financial statements. And with the latter, some voices in the consultation process of the new NFRD recommend that the non-financial report shall be audited in the statutory audit. So that makes it much more important. Yeah? And also, of course, reputation risk will, will, will rise. Um, the NFRD today applies to large undertakings, public interest entities exceeding on their balance sheet dates the criterion of the average of uh, number of uh, 500 employees. Yeah? This limitation in scope may be lifted with the revised NFRD. That means smaller entities could fall under the requirement to report turnover revenue and capex opex for their sustainable activities under Article 8 of the Taxonomy Regulation. And even the so-called small-medium ent entities, M SMEs, uh, will, will not be in scope of the revised NFRD. They are impacted indirectly. Why? Because, for example, banks need to disclose then going forward under the taxonomy a so-called green asset ratio. Yeah? And that's also from 2022 onwards for the loan portfolio. And that also includes loans to SMEs. And to calculate this green asset ratio for an SME loan, banks need to gather the required information. So if we have corporates that do not uh, or are not um, obliged to uh, disclose information under, under the taxonomy regulation, uh, banks and that corporates need to um, agree on bilateral agreements to exchange information so that banks are able to calculate that green asset ratio based on the taxonomy. Okay, so we can see that the scope of companies that are included uh, is quite large. And, and therefore, what kind of impact, if any, do you anticipate on companies' strategy and business models due to this uh, new regulation? That's, that's a good question and, of course, strategic question. And, and um, of, of course, we are very early in the process um, and, and I think we cannot predict everything today. But I think let's try. So first of all, I think it's important to mention that the taxonomy does not prevent financial market participants to finance or invest in activities that are not eligible to the taxonomy. Yeah? Also, not all economic activities that might contribute to mitigate climate change 
or support transition are covered today by the taxonomy. That's what I mentioned already earlier. Yeah. So, no need to. No one says you have to. But the taxonomy and combination with the non-financial reporting directive and the so-called sustainable finance disclosure regulation, that's the thing I mentioned earlier when I said financial market participants that offer financial products need to uh, disclose in pre-contractual information uh, about the taxonomy alignment of their investments. So the NFRD, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, and other regulatory measures like the ECB Guide on Climate-Related Risk and the discussion about a green supporting factor or brown penalizing factor in the capital requirements regulation for banks, all this will lead to a massive shift into more sustainable activities within the next decade. Besides large investors, institutional investors like Allianz, BlackRock and others, uh, have already announced to shift their capital into green assets uh, or companies that substantially contribute to net zero economy within the next 20 to 30 years. And at least for European companies and non-EU companies that want to invest in Europe, the taxonomy will be a guiding principle to label economic activities and investments as green or sustainable. Maybe the EU taxonomy will be aligned to other taxonomies from other economic regions or into global taxonomies, but the guiding principles behind will remain the same. So, to your question, not only from a pure non-financial reporting perspective, it is crucial to analyze the economic activities of your company from a taxonomy perspective and the impact on financing these activities in the future. Regardless if that will lead to a shift in a company's business model, it will lead to a shift in thinking and controlling activities. Companies need to be able to differentiate and economically control their businesses along the economic activities in the taxonomy in the future. So my example was the three different engines. Yeah? Um, and of course, they need to be able to assess the technical screening criteria and the do not significant harm criteria and of course the, the social safeguards as long as we don't have that specific social economy, uh, social uh, taxonomy. Um, so that is foremost a question of data availability, but also a question of capacity and capability of human and technical resources. It is important that controllers, treasurer and accountants understand the taxonomy, the technical criteria, etc. Otherwise, they are not able to manage stakeholder dialogue with investors in the future. Being taxonomy aligned, or at least being supportive to the transition, will be a question of reputation in the future. That is not only because of climate change or other environmental objectives, but also because of the social safeguards, and with that because of the environmental and social responsibility of a company. And with the taxonomy and the accompanying regulations and expectations, that will lead to a change in strategy and business model. To put it in a simpler way, companies that do not change their business model towards a model that contributes with its activities to the environmental objectives, or at least enable others to do so, will most probably not stay relevant in the market. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Max, for this presentation of the main objective and content of the EU taxonomy regulation. Let me try to, uh, to do a wrap-up exercise for our board members and summarize the questions the board should address in relation to the taxonomy. I think there is a first block of question relating to the current situation. How uh, has management performed an impact analysis of the taxonomy regulation? That's the first question that board, uh, board members should, uh, should ask. Second, um, which part of our current activities contribute to the environmental objectives of the taxonomy, starting, as you said, with uh, climate change remediation, as it is the first objective that has been defined so far? Um, third, what are the risks and opportunities for the company in relation to it? So that's the current situation. Then we have probably questions relative to uh, 
what kind of prospective decision uh, the board of directors wants to take, uh, what is the company's trans transition strategy, and how does the taxonomy help to define the transition pathways? What are the objectives in terms of taxonomy aligned revenues, capex, and opex? Um, I can see also that there are other questions relating to disclosure and due diligence. First thing, very practical, are we able to provide the information related, uh, requested by the taxonomy with a reasonable assurance on the accuracy of the data and the information disclosed? Um, are we confident enough as well also to claim the compliance of the company's operation and supply chain to the minimum um, social safeguards, that is the OCD guidelines, as you mentioned, and the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And um, also uh, a question relating to the communication exercise, because we companies have been used to communicate some of them on, on the, the green part of their uh, products and services. And now we have a new definition of uh, what is a green um, portfolio and what is a green uh, revenue. And therefore, companies will have to you know, deal with this new uh, communication exercise. And so when is it a good time to do this and how should it be done? And the last question maybe would be to um, how do we align um, companies' interest and the remuneration of uh, executives on this subject matter, and therefore should new targets linked to sustainable activities uh, objectives be included in executive remuneration? So, some are the questions that um, uh, board members could um, uh, raise uh, in 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 relation to this uh, new regulation and more broadly to the uh, sustainable uh, finance uh, plan of the EU Commission. Now, Eric, I have some questions for you and we would like your views as, as a asset manager. Um, first question, combined with the sustainable finance disclosure regulations, which implications do you anticipate on your investment strategy? Yeah, I think for, for, for us uh, at Nordea, the implications are maybe uh, not so big. I think what it will mean for us is that more and more of our products will move into to the part of our products that we call the, the sustainable or the ESG ones. But we've worked with this for quite a long time. Uh, so, so there aren't that many surprises. But I think for the wider markets, uh, what you will see also is that that more and more asset managers will be taking ESG into account and sustainability into account in a, in a totally different way from what, what has happened before. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I see that within two, three, maybe four years, uh, I would think at the maximum, you will find it difficult to, to sell in the market to retail investors in Europe uh, any products that are not under the SFDR uh, classified as Article 8 or 9. So the Article 6 product will be difficult to sell, and that means that asset managers will also uh, stop stop uh, managing these products and, and and that means that if it's only eight or nine then there are certain criteria that companies have to live up to to, to qualify for those investment portfolios so uh, for our strategy uh, more concentration even more concentration towards the ESG towards the sustainability side uh, and for the wider market I think uh, even a more important shift uh, than, than than what we will see internally at, uh, at Nordea. Some market participants fear that the taxonomy regulation could create a green asset bubble. What do you think of this? Could it lead to a shortage of financing for those activities that are not taxonomy aligned? Yes, well, I, I often get this question about uh, a potential green bubble. And, and I think there are two ways to answer it. And the, the first one is a little bit, uh, you know, a uh, flippant answer is that, well, if it's a bubble, it's a bubble that's not going to burst for another 50 years because, uh, you know, th th these green activities will be attractive or will be necessary until we have fixed the climate crisis, which is uh, unfortunately not being uh, going to be tomorrow or next year or the year after. So, so, so that's quite a long horizon. And, and the other answer uh, is is one that's more from the point of view of the European Commission. Uh, 
because what 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 this whole sustainable finance disclosure regulation and the taxonomy regulation and all the other parts of of the green finance plan for Europe uh, are supposed to do is to redirect capital from from those activities that have uh, you know, uh, high emissions of greenhouse gases uh, that are in other ways environmentally or socially unsustainable uh, to those activities and those modes of production, forms of production uh, that, that create value in a way that does not have these negative externalities. So that is what the commission wants. And, and yes, you will see, uh, I wouldn't call it a bubble, but you will see and you see it already that, that companies that have their house in order from a sustainability point of view uh, they have higher valuations than than those that do not. Uh, part of this is risk. Take an electricity utility company. Uh, if if you don't uh, have, you know, if you have an electricity company, a utility that hasn't started the transition, that is still completely, let's say, in coal-based uh, power production, has not done any investments into renewables. There's a huge transition risk there, and therefore investors will tend to avoid it. So so there's. Uh, you could say a risk-based reason for, for why that company would have a lower valuation than another similar company that has already made those investments. And then uh, on the other hand, there's also, that's the regulation driving investments because it's it's making consumers aware, giving consumers the information to choose and making consumers aware what investment products they want to choose from, from a sustainability point of view. That is then also guiding in turn the asset managers. And that means that more asset managers, especially for those activities that are uh, fully taxonomy aligned, of which there are very few today, uh, clearly a lot of money is going to run after those uh, stocks and bonds. And, and therefore you will see that, that that they will become more expensive. And then you can discuss, uh, you, do you want to call it a bubble or not? Uh, that is exactly what, what the commission wants. It's, it's not a bug in the system, it's a feature. It is what the European Commission wants to happen. What will be the implications for non-EU companies in your portfolio and non-listed companies or SMEs that do not fall under the scope of the uh, non-financial reporting directive. Yeah, let's let's take that in in two bites. So so for for listed companies, for the larger companies that are part of of our regular investment universe for for uh, uh, for the normal investment funds, uh, even if they are not based in the EU or even if they don't have operations in the EU, they still want European investors. Uh, and European investors will not be able to buy them for Article 8 or 9 products, uh, probably not even for 6, because even in Article 6, the, NF the, the SFDR says that you need to, to incorporate uh, sustainability risk into the way you manage your portfolio. So companies that don't want to provide this information are basically going to make themselves out of scope for investment by, by European investors. Uh, and, and I think uh, that that will motivate a lot of companies to adopt uh, reporting of this kind, even if it's only a European uh, legal requirement, it's effectively going to become a global standard because such a big part of, of the investment industry is in Europe and, and uh, it's, it's very hard for companies to rely only on US or Asian investors. Now, uh, when it comes to the non-listed companies and the SMEs, yes, if they have less than the 500 employees, uh, then, then they can call themselves out of scope and, and not uh, report on, on sustainability factors, on ESG factors. But, but they will run into this, uh, you know, if they are partially owned by private equity funds, then at least some of those private equity funds will be wanting to follow uh, some of the SFDR and therefore they will, they will uh, ask these questions. And of course, as private equity investors, they have power on the board, so they will be be, be uh, basically directing the companies to follow this. And uh, when it comes to, to SMEs, uh, even if they, you could say they are maybe family owned or not dependent on, on outside shareholders, uh, most of them will still need bank financing. And what is maybe not so often discussed is that while this regulation applies to uh, investment funds, to asset managers, to pension funds and so on, banks are at the same time going through some of the same exercises and, and uh, uh, some of the, of course, the Nordic banks uh, clearly, but but also some of the Dutch and some of the big French banks I know are already asking these questions of their clients. So, so I don't think that uh, even if you are legally out of the scope uh, of, of, of all of this regulation that you can necessarily escape it because some of the financial counterparts that you're going to have will be subject to the, the legislation or will want to opt into that legislation. And the last question for you, um, Eric, 
which advice would you give to a board member in the next in this new context yeah so so i think the advice that i would give and what i would be uh, sure to make certain of if if i was on the board of uh, a company is that the management has has really thought this through in relation to the activities of the company that that uh, uh, there is a, a clear understanding first of all of what this regulation implies uh, which channels it can influence the company through so bank financing private equity ownership uh, uh, securities markets uh, financing and so on and 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 also what the company then needs to do so so as a company you have to decide do we want to go along with this or do we want to rely on investors that maybe on investors that maybe don't care uh, of which i think there are going to be fewer and fewer there will still be some of course so that's a choice you can make but you have to make it a conscious choice so so you need really to have uh, a fair uh, dialogue with with the management of the company and in the board about how is your company going to position itself Uh, in in relation to the taxonomy, in relation to SFDR, uh, to the whole of the European Green Finance Plan, what is it that you want uh, the regulators to see? What is it that you want your clients to see? Uh, because in many cases, if you have uh, retail end users of your products, uh, that that can also be uh, an important avenue of influence. So you need to decide uh, very very consciously where do you want to be in the spectrum of of uh, from very sustainable to 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 not sustainable at all. Uh, what are the implications of that under the regulation in terms of financing and so on? Uh, and, and what are the steps then that the company needs to take to bring itself to the place where it wants to be? Uh, because there is, a, unfortunately, no business as usual here. It's, it's, it's not going to be something where you can just say, yeah, yeah, and lean back. Uh, uh, it, it will take a lot of work. Uh, it will take a lot of planning. It will take even investment uh, in, in many cases uh, to, to, to get to where you want to be but 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 that is something that you need to decide uh, and and i would say that if you're starting to do that now you're already probably a little bit late so so this is something that as a board member or, or even as a as a chair uh, of a board i would put at the top of the agenda uh, not just as as one item on one meeting but but really as something that is uh, very very important strategically for for the future of the company to conclude this video I would like to thank EY and Nordea, and more specifically Max and Eric for their time and for sharing their knowledge and experience with us. I would also like to thank ICODA, the European voice, voice of board members, for hosting this video, which is the first of a long series to come. So thank you very much, all. I hope you enjoyed it.